How will we address the climate crisis? Climate One with Greg Dalton brings together advocates, influencers, and policymakers in empowering conversations that connect all aspects of the climate emergency, the individual and the systemic, the scary and the exciting, to help you understand the most critical issue of our time. Because addressing the climate crisis begins by talking about it. Former U.S. Senator Russ Feingold became a household name co-authoring the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, more commonly known as McCain-Feingold. It's the only major piece of federal campaign finance reform legislation passed into law in decades. Today, he's using his legal and legislative experience to tackle the erosion of protections for biodiversity and elections. Biodiversity, climate, and the courts. Today on Climate One. I'm delighted to welcome Russ Feinkold to Climate One from the Commonwealth Club. He's president of the American Constitution Society, honorary ambassador for the Campaign for Nature, and former United States Senator from Wisconsin. Russ, Russ Feingold, welcome to Climate One. Greg, good to be on and good to see you. You served in the U.S. Senate when climate action had bipartisan support. Your friend John McCain and Barack Obama were in basically the same place when they ran for president in 2008. Also that year, a TV ad featuring Nancy Pelosi and Newt Gingrich sat, sitting on a couch. Let's play that back now. I'm Nancy Pelosi, lifelong Democrat and Speaker of the House. And I'm Newt Gingrich, lifelong Republican, and I used to be Speaker. We don't always see eye to eye, do we, Newt? No, but we do agree our country must take action to address climate change. We need cleaner forms of energy, and we need them fast. If enough of us demand action from our leaders, we can spark the innovation we need. Go to WeCanSolveIt.org. Together, we can do this. Senator Feingold, what <laughs> comes to your heart and mind when you see Nancy Pelosi and Newt Gingrich sitting on a couch in front of the U.S. Capitol saying we got to solve climate? Well, it, it, it makes me very sad to think about the fact that we don't have that kind of cooperation now. Uh, Speaker Gingrich was not the easiest guy to get along with on issues, but the fact that uh, Speaker Pelosi and Speaker Gingrich were able to come together in this reminds me of really, frankly, what I grew up with here, which was a Wisconsin tradition. We had Republicans and we had Democrats, but when it came to the thing we called conservation, before we called it environmentalism, Everybody just put aside those differences. Our, our famous governors, Warren Knowles and Gaylord Nelson, both, you know, both governors, but one Republican, one Democrat, were symbols of the cooperation on these issues, preserving national natural lands. It just wasn't a partisan issue. And when I got to Congress, it was still that way. I got there in 1992. But on so many issues, a lot of the Democrats and Republicans we're willing to work together. And that's how Gaylord Nelson was able to pass as a senator uh, the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act and, and the Clean Air Act, all those things in the 60s. And in fact, Richard Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency. It's, it's not like he was an anti-environmentalist, but things sharply changed, Greg, uh, at some point uh, in the late 2000s. And uh, I think we both know what it was. Um, it was a direct attempt to take climate out of the sphere of bipartisanship and to turn it into a, uh, a partisan bloodbath led by some very powerful corporate interests. But it really changed things to the point where we have a, a really bad divide on this issue and almost nothing seems to get done, at least at the national level, with regard to climate change. Yeah, so much was happening around that time, 2006 to 10 in there. I believe Freedom House, uh, has, which charts the, the freedom of governments around the world, they started to see a decline in free democracies around the world around that 06, and it's, it shrunk then. One other big thing there, 2010, the Supreme Court handed down Citizens United that undid the 2002 McCain-Feingold restrictions on campaign finance and allowed unlimited funds to be poured into elections. You know, how do you connect that with what other changes, the fossil fuel companies, things that were going on at that time? Well, you're right that it was the, the rise of the Tea Party after, uh, as President Obama was coming into office that somehow became identified not only with being against a health care bill that hadn't even been introduced yet uh, and claiming that President Obama was born overseas. But a third uh, part of it was a concerted attack that I witnessed 
personally, on any attempt to try to do something about this legislatively, the so-called cap and trade legislation was attacked as a socialist plot that would destroy the economy. So as I did these town meetings in 2009 and 2010, I was shocked at the disinformation. And this is key because the disinformation, as we know right now, is a big part of the overall authoritarian strategy in the world and the attack on democracy, this was one of the first experiments with it, led by the tobacco companies first, with regard to smoking. Right. And we, yeah, we saw that there. And then the, you know, the rise of the Tea Party. You know, do you think that, uh, you know, people of color would often say that um, they knew that electing a black man would bring a big racial backlash? Do you think, what part do you think race played in that? I'm sad to say that I think race played way too much a part. You know, I literally made a promise when I ran for the U.S. Senate in 1992 that every year I would go to each of Wisconsin's 72 counties and hold an open town meeting. And we did it for 18 years. But all of a sudden, after Obama was elected, before he was even sworn in, all of a sudden, all these angry people that I'd never seen before came in and started saying that he was a socialist and he was going to do this and he was going to do that. And they actually scared people away, people that came every year. They were always very uh, mild sessions where if anybody sort of they tended to be more liberals because of who, who I am. But <laughs> whenever somebody came in and was a conservative, I made sure the crowd treated that person with respect. And all of a sudden, these things became screaming sessions. And you could see that across the country at that point. So this was part of the strategy. Disinformation, disrupt public meetings where people could come together. And yes, even in some of the rural counties where a lot of, I thought a lot of liberals lived over near the Mississippi River, I remember some of the people that I understood to be progressives on the environment saying, hey, this climate change thing is a hoax. Hmm. And I've written about this in a book I wrote in 2011. Uh, something really twisted people on this in about 2010 and 2011. Right. And of course, calling cap and trade a socialist plot is pretty ironic because cap and trade was the Wall Street friendly version of tackling climate change. It was favored by big business. Exactly. It was not the other one. Well, when President Obama came in, he famously decided to tackle health care first in his first term ahead of climate. Now, you know, get partly that was gas prices were very high and people were angry. Now, President Biden once again is putting the transition to cleaner energy a bit to the side as he looks to the midterms and worries about high gas prices. Um, so what do you think about the political calculus right now of, mm, we got to drill more, increase fossil fuel supply, get prices down, climate's important, but we can't put it first and top right now? Well, you're right. This just keeps happening. Uh, and it's incredibly important that we deal with the climate issue, as well as, I might add, the biodiversity issue, which is a related issue that was also an outgrowth of the Rio conference in 1992, where those treaties mm -hmm. were initiated. Uh, and somehow these things get put on the back burner. And you can understand why. Look, I know when Barack Obama became president, I knew that he was on the right issue on health care because every year for 18 years, that I did town meetings, healthcare was the thing that people most mentioned. Problem with the climate issue, as you know, even though there were heroic efforts by people like Al Gore and others to make it sort of accessible, is that it is more complicated. It's harder to connect to on a day-to-day -day basis. You can see the strange things going on with the climate, but it's so heavily laden with science and complexities that it's, it's, it's real fertile ground if people want to try to distort things, particularly when something like this might involve sacrifice. If you can convince people, you know, you don't really need to do this. There's always been climate change. It's no big deal. Well, people would rather hear that than that they're going to have to sacrifice for it. And, and so that's, it creates kind of a, a Sisyphean, Sisyphus kind of situation where you keep pushing this boulder up the hill. Yeah, the costs are today and the benefits are in the future. And we're not very good at that in our political cultures. Like we want benefits today and the costs tomorrow or never. You know, I, I believe fervently in democracy, but you're right. The, the fact that we do have these regular elections and we're frequently changing hands, it's very hard for political people to be able to sit down and draft up a, a long term vision. You know, frankly, the Chinese are much better at it, but they do it in a very autocratic way that ultimately may backfire on it. 
because they're trying so hard to preserve the dominance of the party. But they are able to exude an environmental or an industrial or a foreign policy out 10, 15 years. So this is one of the great challenges of democracy in this uh, interdependent age, is how do you plan forward when you know that it could go back and forth? We may have another huge shift this year politically that could stop in the tracks of even what President Biden is trying to do in this area. We're seeing this moment now where there are some Democrats who are saying, you know, uh, when President Biden was a candidate, Biden, he was kind of moderate on climate. He kind of he moved as a candidate, got a lot more uh, in tune with environmental and, and climate justice. You bucked your party at, at times and were were kind of a, a bit of a maverick. At one point, you were the only Democratic senator to vote against your party on a procedural motion during the Clinton impeachment. How do you look at Democrats on the left now, whether it's the squad or Sunrise, who are trying to push the party faster toward fossil fuels, yet that is that jeopardizing reaching swing voters and swing dates, swing districts? Um, how do you see that? You know, I really don't think it's a mistake for the progressives and the left to push hard on this. Um, Sadly, there are other issues that are far more explosive that the Republicans obviously are going to exploit, as you can see in the uh, confirmation hearing of Ketanji Brown-Jackson. They are going with a soft on crime kind of approach like Nixon did in 68 and like George Bush the first did with Willie Horton in 1988. And so uh, as sad as that is and as wrong as that is and as much uh, people have to resist the attempt to scare people and frankly to tie it to race, which is what they're trying to do, I believe that pushing on the climate issue as well as biodiversity in the end is, is a winner with voters. And it would, it would be a mistake for progressives, whether Republican or Democrat, to back away from it. I still think there is a fundamental common sense view that uh, this is worth doing. The, the problem with the fossil fuel industry is not so much what they're able to do during an election. It's what they're able to do after the election when people get elected. So in terms of election strategy, I, I think people should be plenty firm and strong with regard to the vital need to act uh, aggressively with regard to climate change. Well, so many of those things, cleaning up the, it brings cleaner air, you know, there's all sorts of like so-called, you know, other benefits that come along with it. Uh, it's not just about things far away. It's, it's cleaner air in a lot of communities if we move away from fossil fuels. Redistricting is happening this year. A lot happening in the courts. You're focused on, on the courts somewhat. How do you view what's happened in the courts with regard to redistricting and the kind of battling over the, the rules of the next election? Now, if people wonder how is it that you know the majority of people believe that climate change is a serious problem, the majority of people want various environmental measures, how is it that that's the case, and that you still end up with legislatures all over the country that are hell bent on preventing serious climate change legislation? In fact, we had incidents here in Wisconsin where they would even try to make sure that nobody in the state government was allowed to mention the phrase climate change, including the daughter of former. Senator Gaylord Nelson, the founder of Earth Day. They tried to punish her for that. How does that happen? Well, it's through reapportionment. It's through gerrymandering. Let me give you an example. You know, we had a Republican governor and Republican legislature consistently from 2010 to 2018, and they did lots of bad things, um, undoing a labor movement, undoing collective bargaining. But in 2018, the Democrats had a good election. They won the governorship here the lieutenant governorship, the state treasurer, and the attorney general. It was a clear Democratic majority. Guess what? In the legislature, not only did Democrats not pick up ground, they lost ground in both the House and the Senate, uh, the Assembly and the Senate. The same voters. Why is that? Because the districts were, in a partisan way, redone so that the votes of Democrats, particularly African Americans in the uh, southeastern part of the state, were, were minimized. And a case was taken all the way to the United States Supreme Court based on the Wisconsin case, as well as others, saying, you know, this is this is something that shouldn't be allowed. And unfortunately, this court, as in so many other cases, said, no, actually, uh, you know, uh, that's fine. You can do it on a partisan basis. So what happened is, even though clearly a majority of the people of this state want action in this area, it can't get done. And so now the Supreme Court has intervened again, as we're about to have the decision made about what the lines are going to be for the next 10 years. And in this case, Greg, our Wisconsin Supreme Court did the right thing at first. One of the conservative justices said, this isn't right. 
and he voted with the progressives, and he said, with regard to the state legislative uh, program, the governor's plan should be used. Well, guess what? United States Supreme Court and the shadow docket, without even having an oral argument, without even really having a briefing, quietly struck it down. And it went back to the Supreme Court, and they went the other way. So what does that mean? Ten more years of the frustrations of the will of the people of Wisconsin, 10 more years of gerrymandering, and 10 more years of very unlikely progress on environmental issues, including climate change. The independent state legislature doctrine is a belief that state legislatures are the only governing bodies who can determine how elections are run with no input from state courts or governors. How serious a threat to democracy is the independent state legislature doctrine? Whenever you hear one of these things the first time, you know, before you realize the money behind it and what they're going to do, the Federalist Society and others, you go, well, that sounds crazy, because it is crazy. The idea is that the legislature can simply make up the rules or take election results, stall election officials, and that the courts in the states can't even review it. The idea that they do something that's blatantly illegal or unconstitutional and the state court or the Supreme Court can't review it is absurd. And yet they're advancing it. And there is a reason to believe, potentially, that as many as four of the members of the Supreme Court already support it. So this would gut our democracy. It would be totally autocratic. Now, the Constitution specifically does give the authority to the states and the state legislatures to help make election rules unless the Congress decides otherwise. There is a provision like that. But that doesn't mean that they can do things that actually change the results of elections and don't actually have votes counted based on the actual vote, vote totals as President Trump wanted. And so it's a dangerous doctrine. I think it's totally wrong. And it would undo our, essentially would undo the idea of our democracy at its core. Some people on the right would say that, you know, doubts in it about the integrity of our election progress uh, process actually began in 2016 with claims of Russian influence uh, in the election. Clearly, I think the, the Russians tried. Do you think that the R Russia actually influenced the 2016 outcome? And is that could you see how that might be the seed of doubts about on the other side about election integrity? Well, actually, I think for many of us, it goes back to 2000 and the Bush v. Gore decision that handed the presidency to George Bush instead of Al Gore based on uh, questionable voting counts in Florida. And you saw the beginning, you know, that battle there uh, between sort of Federalist Society people and progressives. In fact, it's the reason that the American Constitutional Society, what Constitutional Society was founded, was because of that first thing. You, you got the idea that instead of a presidential election being sort of a sacred decision, that it could be political. And in fact, the Republican appointees on the court voted that way, and, and that was that. But yes, 2016 was a turning point. I don't think anybody has any real doubt in their mind that the Russians had a heavy influence on that. Of course they did. And, and we know the that they were- At the level or at the like John Podesta email level? I mean, because that's a difference. I think it's a, an open question, and I think it's possibly all of the above. I don't know for sure. All I know is the more evidence comes out, the more it suggests the depths of what they were doing and continue to do. So uh, I think there's no doubt that uh, President Trump who benefited from it was perfectly happy to get that benefit. And there's a lot of evidence that there was uh, potentially coordination. Uh, but, you know, I can't be the definitive word on that. It, it definitely, it, what it did is set the stage for everybody to start questioning the legitimacy of election results, yeah. liberal or conservative. And then people get in their silo of Fox News or whatever their Twitter account is. And then people start only believing, uh, they, they don't believe the election results. You know, I, I worked, as you said, on foreign policy for many years in so many countries, African countries and others. It was always the case in those elections that whoever lost said it was rigged. Well, that's where we're at, yeah, we where do. nobody's going to accept the election results and Really, you can't survive as a democracy if people don't accept the results of elections. There is bipartisan support for reforming the, the Electoral Count Act. You know, what impact would that have? And is that kind of fighting the last war? Well, you have to at least fight that war. It's not enough, but at least to, there is bipartisan support for that. That would at least prevent the kind of stunt that, that apparently President Trump and his allies are trying to pull on January 6th. You know, it would have that effect, relatively narrow effect. 
uh, it does not address uh, so many issues of what we now call election subversion. So for so many years, we've been concerned about first getting people out to vote, encouraging people to vote. Then we became concerned about voter suppression, trying to prevent people from voting. But now we're in a whole nother world. The ballots have already been submitted and people say, well, we don't like what they're saying about who uh, won. We're going to subvert the election. We're going to have people put on ele uh, electors for the electoral college who don't even believe in the results. And so this is a whole nother level, an even more dangerous level that, frankly, progressives have to step up to the plate and fight this at the precinct level. We have initi initiated a new program at the American Constitution si Society the last few weeks to get people to pledge to be poll workers. Because a lot of our poll workers, you know, a lot of these people have been doing this for 34 years, 30, 40 years, wonderful local community people. They're scared to go to the polls because they think it might be a place where there's going to be uh, rough stuff, maybe even violence. And so we're encouraging our lawyers and others to say, I'll volunteer. Uh, and, and we need to do that. Otherwise, this intimidation will grow. And one of the things I want to point out is when you intimidate, you don't just intimidate the poll workers. A lot of people, you know, a lot of older people, a lot of people that aren't used to politics, they look at that and they go, you know, I don't think I'm going to go down to that polling place. It doesn't, I don't really feel that strongly about it. And that's how the big interests and those who want to suppress our society and even fascist interests can prevail. Most of our listeners are probably familiar with the Conference of Parties or COP on climate change. Last year it was in Glasgow. This year it's coming up in Egypt. But there's also a Conference on Parties to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, which you've been deeply involved with. So why is biodiversity so much less in the public spotlight than climate? That's an interesting story because there were three treaties hatched, basically, at the Rio Convention in 1992. One was the Climate Treaty. One was the CBD, the Convention on Biodiversity, and the other was a, a treaty about what's called desertification, which is where uh, deserts swallow up arable lands in places like Africa. Well, the climate one was endorsed first in the United States, and actually under the first George Bush, it was ratified by the Senate because the Senate was still Democrat and Bush was apparently supportive of it. Mm -hmm. By the time the uh, Convention on Biodiversity kind of got traction, which was just a little bit later, Jesse Helms, a senator from North Carolina, had become the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And he managed to engineer the defeat of a number of treaties that he said were part of sort of a world government conspiracy. One was a treaty for the rights of the children. One was a treaty relating to the law of the sea that we have not ratified. And now, if you can believe it, Greg, we're like the only country in the world that hasn't ratified the Convention on Biodiversity. I mean, Russia's done it. China's done it. China is hosting the um, conference in Kunming for this. The United States has recently joined what we call the High Ambition Coalition through our administration, which is trying to get the goal established in Kunming, kind of like the climate goal of 1.5 degrees. This goal is that 30% of the planet, water and land, will be preserved by 2030. Now, the scientists say we need, may need to do more than that, but it's based on a report done by a couple hundred top-notch scientists released in May of 2019 that says that we are going to lose potentially a million species to extinction in the coming years. And the report says that the loss of, of biodiversity, of course, animals, but also plants and, and you know fungi and all kinds of things like that, that that loss could be as serious as climate change. And of course, the two are totally interrelated. I mean, if you look at the lo loss to the coral reefs, that is caused, that's a loss of biodiversity caused significantly by the warming of the water. Vice versa, damage to the climate if you have the exploitation of the Congolese forest, which is the second some people call it the second lung of the planet after the Amazon. You get rid of those trees, you don't just lose the biodiversity of the trees, it's no longer a sink for the CO2. It no longer does the, that. So most of the people that I've talked to about this around the world, and we are working as an international group, agree that the two issues should be linked and that there should be more awareness of the biodiversity, which I actually hope will somehow be more bipartisan than the climate one has been.
Last question, Senator. Our culture is deeply human-centered, and declining biodiversity is invisible to most people. They don't see how a connection, maybe they understand bees pollinate food. They're like, okay, that's a problem. How do you get people to connect and care about biodiversity when they don't see a direct personal connection? It's hard, but, you know, there's a couple of levels to this. The truth is that if you have the continuing exploitation of agricultural areas, huge food shortages will occur throughout the world. These big palm oil operations in Indonesia and others lead to the loss of biodiversity. And then you have the loss of pollination. I think a lot of people realize that Certain animals and certain things that used to be around aren't around as much. In fact, I saw a study that since I was in high school, 50 years, 1970, when Earth Day started, we've lost 30% of all the sort of normal birds you would see in North America. 30% of them. They're gone. And so people might say, well, there's some birds around. Well, they're not as many as there used to be. On the other hand, through environmental efforts, we have animals that we've never had before. Across the street from where I am right now, there's a conservancy. Sandhill cranes all over the place. Wild turkeys. Um, and so it's a mixed picture where people might say, well, you know, there's, there's more than there used to be when I was young. But the fundamental concern about land usage and about not preserving enough, it is ultimately very threatening to people's stability and to the stability of our society. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your pods. Thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next time, everybody.